In this recording, I'm going to go over uh, some IB chemistry uh, questions from the IB database uh, question bank. And I'm going to teach you two things. First of all, a lot of students uh, get worried about doing an exam without a calculator. But uh, for these kind of questions, the IB is very careful to choose uh, questions that are easy to solve. And also, they rely on the concept of elimination. So most of the answers you can eliminate straight away, generally leaving to the two most correct answers to where you choose the most correct answer. They're going to be two very similar ones. But if you learn the art of actual elimination, it makes your life so much easier, which means that you don't have to spend the time uh, looking through all of the options in order to get the answer. The other thing is, is that you don't have to calculate all of the time. Sometimes the questions are basically just getting you to think about uh, what the question is saying. A lot of the time, the answer is an actual question, so you have to learn to dissect the question. So here it goes. I'm going to teach you um, some techniques, and I'm focusing here on topics one to four and topic 10, just the fundamentals of it. And the first question says, how many oxygen atoms are present in 0.04 moles of barium hydroxide that is hydrated? So just looking at this one here and here, it's asking me for the oxygen atoms, okay? So how many oxygen atoms? All I need to remember is any time I'm asked for the number of particles, I'm looking at big M. And I have the number of moles, and the thing that I'm looking at specifically is the number of oxygen atoms. Now, this is a hydrated sample of barium hydroxide, which means that I need to count the total number of oxygen atoms. So here you can see that I have two oxygens, and here I have eight, so don't forget to add them. So here I have two plus eight, which gives me 10. So here I need to find the number of oxygen atoms in this sample, given that I have that the number of moles is 0 0.05 moles, and, they are, and you are given Avogadro's constant. Okay, now looking at the options that I have, option A is 3.01 times 10 to the 23, B is 6.02 times 10 to the 23, C is 3.01 times 10 to the 24, and D is 6.02 times 10 to the 24. I can eliminate B and D automatically. First of all, the number of moles is 0 0.05. That means I'm gonna get uh, about a half of 6.02. So that's why I can easily eliminate B and D. So then the next question is asking you is, I need to find the number uh, of particles, which is the number of oxygen atoms, given the number of moles. So the formula that I need is N is equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's number. So I'm given 0 0.05, and I know that there's 10 atoms of oxygen, and I need to multiply this by 6.02 times 10 to the 23. This can be rearranged to say 5 times 10 to the minus 2 times 10 times 10 uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. You do not need to expand on this. So here you can clearly see that I'm going to divide 6.02 by 2 because a half is 0.5. Okay, so then 0 0.05 is basically 0.5 times 10 to the minus 1. So therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. So here, as you can see, that the answer was A. Next question, which molecule is polar? So this is getting you to think about topic four, which is bonding. And whenever we look at polar, we think of covalent bonds, because as you remember, covalent bonds are two types. We've got nonpolar covalent, which is equal sharing of electrons, and polar covalent, which means that I have a difference in electronegativities, which means unequal sharing. The electrons are closer to the more electronegative element. So if you can remember this, then you have to remember that any molecule that is ionic, which is basically an ionic compound, would not be polar because it'll be more than polar. The electrons have been completely transferred over to the anion. So looking at these options here, we've got beryllium hydride, aluminium hydride, uh, phosphorus hydride, and silicon hydride. Okay. So with these options here, I can clearly see that this option can be eliminated and this option can be eliminated. And I can easily eliminate silicon hydride because silicon belongs to the same group as carbon, which makes it uh, equal sharing. And this leaves the most correct answer, which is the phosphorus hydride. So here is the right answer. And I know also that phosphorus belongs to the same group as nitrogen, and this is ammonia, and this is a polar molecule. So 
as you can see here, that the correct answer is C. Next question, which structure of CF2Cl2 is shown with the correct bond and molecular dipoles? Okay, so not only do I need to look at the correct bonding, but I need to have a molecular dipole. The molecular dipole means I have electrons. Uh, the electrons are more closely towards the more electronegative elements. So I need to look at something that looks like this. So this arrow shows me that I have a dipole moment, and the arrow is pointing to the more electronegative element. So I need to have the correct orientation and also the correct dipole moment. So let's look at the structures that we have. So these are the three structures that we have, okay? So I can easily eliminate the first two because I don't see a dipole moment here. What I'm left over with is option C and option D. Looking here, I can clearly see that this is pointing towards the chlorine atoms, whereas this one is pointing towards the fluorine atoms. Anytime you see a fluorine, this is going to be the most electronegative element. So I can also quickly eliminate this, leaving me with the correct answer, which is D. Next question. Alloying, alloying a metal with a metal of smaller atomic radius can disrupt the lattice and make it more difficult for atoms to slide over each other. Which property will increase as a result? Now, looking at the properties of metals, which is reliant on the metallic bonding, I either want to make the metal malleable, which means I can move it without bend it, move it without breaking it, or I want to make it really strong so that it basically you can't move. So when I'm fitting the metal with smaller atoms, okay, it stops them from sliding uh, over each other. When I do that, I make the metal very strong. So that means I'm not looking at electrical conductivity. I'm not looking at ductility. I'm not looking at malleability. I'm actually looking for strength, which is the correct answer. Next question. Chlorofluorocarbons, which are CFCs, contain bonds with the following lengths. So you've got a carbon-carbon, which is 1.54 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Then the carbon-fluorine bond, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And then uh, carbon-to-chlorine bond, which is 1.77 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. What is the order of increasing bond strength in CFC molecules? So here what you need to remember is that the shorter the bond, the stronger it is, the longer the bond, the weaker it is, okay? So I can clearly see here that this here, the, uh, the carbon to chlorine bond is going to be my weakest. So here, the only option I can have is this one here because that's the only one that lists it as the weakest. And then you can see that the carbon carbon would be in the middle and the carbon fluorine will be at the end. So the, here is an example where you can directly go to the answer without having to worry about looking at anything else because you just look on the left-hand side. You need to make sure that there's a carbon-chlorine bond. This is the only option that has that. So this is the only realistic answer that you can have, as you can see. Next question is really easy. What is the change of state for a gas to a solid? Remember that you're going from gas directly to a solid. You're not going through the liquid phase. So the only thing that you can get is deposition. Next question is for topic 10, which are isomers of C5H12? A reminder that when we're talking about isomers, okay, they have the same molecular formula, okay, but different structural formula, okay, which means that it always has to have the correct number of atoms that are present. So here are my options, okay, so again, this is the skeletal uh, structure. You need to count the total number of carbon atoms. You can clearly see that there's one, two, three, four, five here. One, two, three, four, five here. So this is a correct answer. This is a correct answer. Whereas here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, which makes this a hexane. So this is an incorrect answer. Then the correct answer would only be one and two only. This next question asks you for the number of moles of carbon dioxide that are produced by the complete combustion of 7.0 grams of ethene, which is C2H4, obviously in the gaseous state. What it also gives you is the relative molecular mass, okay? Whenever you're given the relative molecular mass, that means you do not need to go to the periodic table to get the molar mass of the molecule. They've already given you that value and you need to use it. And especially in paper one, you need to use these values because they're making it easier for you to calculate. So how do I solve such a question? The first thing that you need to do is write a balanced equation. 
So I know that if I have a combustion reaction, that I'm taking a fuel and I'm burning it in oxygen to get carbon dioxide and water. So the first thing that I need to do is write the equation. So I have C2H4 plus oxygen to give me CO2 plus H2O. Then I need to balance the equation. I have two carbons here, one here, so I need to add two here. I have four hydrogens here, so then I need to add two here. And then the total number of oxygens here is four plus two, which is six. So then I need to have three oxygen atoms here. I know that I have five grams, uh, sorry, seven grams of ethene. And what I need to find is the number of moles of carbon dioxide. So the best way I can help you with dealing with these kind of questions is always start with the side that doesn't have a question mark. So I can't do anything on this side. I need to go to the other side, find the number of moles, use the mole ratio to find the number of moles of my unknown. So the first step is to find the number of moles of C2H4. Okay, so then that's the number of the mass divided by the molar mass. So this gives you 7.0 grams divided by 28 grams per mole. Okay, so this gives you 0.25 moles. So as you can see, it's really easy to calculate without a calculator. So now I know that the number of moles of ethene is point uh, sorry, 0.25 moles, which means that the number of moles of CO2 is going to be twice as much. So this is what I want. And this is what I have. So the number of moles of CO2 is equal to two times the number of moles of C2H4. So that's two times 0.25, which is the answer B, which is 0.5 moles. A lot of students uh, are worried when they see any questions regarding periodicity, but really periodicity is so simple. Most of the uh, periodic trends are based on the idea of the distance of the nucleus to the valence electrons. So the shorter the distance between the nucleus, which holds the, number, the protons, and the valence electrons, the stronger the attraction is, which makes it keep its electrons, okay? which makes it more electronegative, which makes its uh, size decrease, which is more likely to form anions, which more likely to basically gain electrons than lose electrons. The larger the distance between the uh, nucleus and the outer electrons, the weaker the attraction. So that means that these electrons are going to be more likely to be lost than gained, okay, which makes them more electropositive, which makes them more likely to be metals, etc. So the question here is saying, which property of elements increases down a group, but it increases across a period? So the easiest way I can tell you how to deal with these kind of questions is actually draw it up. So it's going to increase down a group, but it decreases across a period, okay? So it's increasing down a group, and it's increase, uh, decreasing across a period. So if we look at the atomic radius, okay, it does decrease as we go down a group because I'm filling more and more shells, and the number of protons is also increasing. So the atomic radius is going to basically increase as a result. And across the period, the atomic radius also decreases because you are going from metals to nonmetals, and the attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons is getting stronger. This is because you're filling the same shell. Because I'm filling the same shell, I'm adding more valence electrons as I'm adding more protons. So that means that the pull between the nucleus and the valence electrons is getting stronger. So think about it as a magnet. I'm getting a stronger magnet in the middle. And I'm adding valence electrons at the end. So the stronger the magnet that I have, which is a plus, and I have the minus, it's going to make the uh, electrons come closer towards the nucleus, which makes the atomic radius decrease. So this is the correct answer. B is going to be automatically eliminated because electronegativity does increase across a period, but going down a group, it actually decreases. Ionic radius works the same way as an atomic radius, but the difference here is when I look at ionic radius, there is a difference between a cation and an anion. So this cannot be an option. And the last one is ionization energy, which is incorrect because the ionization energy means that I'm able to lose electrons. Well, when I'm going across a period, it's going to become harder for me to lose that electron because they're becoming metals, which means that they're becoming more electronegative. They have a high electron affinity which means that their ionization energy decreases across a period. So the correct answer is A.
This next question is asking you to think about resonance structures. And anytime I think of the word resonance structure, that means I can draw the same molecule in different ways. And in order to have resonance, I need to have at least one double bond. With single bonds, it doesn't work because there's only one way of drawing it. So for example, if I have methane, I can only draw methane in one way. If I have water, there's only one way I can draw water. So these cannot have resonance structures. On the other hand, if I have a molecule like ozone, ozone is three oxygen atoms joined together, one through a single bond and another through a double bond. Okay, so more realistically speaking, this is going to look something like this. Okay, so I can draw it where the single bond is between oxygen one and oxygen two, and the double bond is between oxygen two and oxygen three. I can also draw it so that between oxygen one and two, I can have the double bond, and between oxygen two and three is a single bond. So that means I can draw this molecule two ways, and both of them are equally correct. Usually we represent this with a molecule that looks something like this. These dotted lines represent the double bond can be equally between O1 and O2 or between O2 and O3. This means I have resonance, and as you can see here, I do have double bonds, which enables me to have a resonance. So let's look at the options that I have. I have H2S. And I can automatically eliminate this. H2S is the same as saying water molecules. These are all single bonds. A nitrate does have double bonds, and you can actually draw it with a resonance structure. So it will look something like this, okay? Which is the same as saying like this, which is the same as saying like this. Okay, so it does have resonance structures. H2O2, which is peroxide, is a single bond, so this is incorrect, and this is incorrect. So the realistic answer, only realistic answer, is going to be nitric acid. All right. This next question is asking you, 0.2 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate, which is this thing here, okay, is decomposed. That means I'm taking a big substance and I'm breaking it apart by heating until constant mass. And this is the equation that you have. You clearly can see that it's balanced, but it's always a good idea to make sure that the equations are balanced just in case they're trying to trick you. And the question is asking you how many moles of gas are produced. Now here, it's important to realize that they didn't specify which of these gases, so you're going to assume that you need to add them together. So they're telling you that you have two moles of this that produces one mole of sodium carbonate, one mole of water, and one mole of carbon dioxide. So here, if I look at this equation, and this is why it needs to be balanced, you know that two moles of uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate is going to produce one plus one, which is an overall two moles of gas, okay? And I have 0.2 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So because they're gonna be in a one-to-one -one ratio, because two and overall two, then the correct answer is going to be B. Next question is asking you, what is the explanation for the high melting point of sodium chloride? The first thing that you do in these kind of questions is ask yourself, what kind of bonding is happening between the sodium and chloride? First of all, I have a metal and a non-metal. So here I'm looking at an intramolecular bond. And the specific type of intramolecular bond here that I have is an ionic bond. So obviously, A is going to be incorrect. Okay. C is going to be incorrect. And when we're looking at ionic uh, bonding, I don't look at delocalized electrons. So the only option that I have is B. Okay, so I don't even need to read the question here. The important thing is to understand the definition of an ionic bond. Once you understand what your bonds are and how they behave, you can directly go to the answer without having to worry about the other um, answers or answer choices. And also looking at the actual statement. So I'm, I'm not telling you just pick the one that is most correct and don't actually read it. Follow through and read it. You can tell that it's the correct answer because first of all, it's telling you it's an electrostatic attraction between sodium chloride ions and it is strong, okay? Ionic bonding is very strong. So it's an electrostatic attraction between sodium chloride ions and you're specifying that they're ions, which is specific to ionic bonding and it is strong, okay? So that's how you get to those answers.